The world of radio and wireless communication is fascinating, isn't it? Most people have heard of Guglielmo Marconi, a brilliant Italian indeed for his transatlantic experiments. However, I too have been deeply immersed in the study and experimentation of wireless communication right here in Callaway County, Murray, Kentucky. I'm Nathan B. Stubblefield, born in the year 1860 as the third son to William Jefferson Stubblefield and Victoria Frances Bowman. People often referred to me as peculiar from a young age, a label that stuck with me for life. I suppose my fascination with the intricacies of science and electricity made me stand out from the rest. I didn't have many friends as a child, but Duncan Holt was different. We both shared an insatiable curiosity for the natural world, particularly where science and electricity were concerned. We spent countless hours at the Callaway Times office. It wasn't that we were particularly fond of the man who ran the place, W.O. Ware, but it was the only place we could get our hands on copies of the Scientific American magazine. That was the premier technical publication of our time, and it was a window into the wider world of scientific discovery for us. In my youth, I attended a boarding school in Farmington, Kentucky. That's where I met Ada Mae Buchanan, a lovely woman and the great-grandniece of President James Buchanan. We married in 1881, which marked the end of my formal education. I had completed up to the eighth grade by that time. But it also began a new chapter of my life, one where I would take on the roles of a husband, father, and above all an inventor. I remember those days well. Standing before the audience in Murray back in 1882, I had the theory and the conviction that I could harness the Earth's natural currents not just to make a compass needle jump, but to carry the sound of voice and music. When the crowd didn't share my enthusiasm, it did nothing but ignite my will further. At the time, young Guglielmo Marconi was but a child, far away in Italy, and I was already grappling with its potential and challenges. The physics of the transmitter were one thing, the receiver was another beast altogether. Despite the technical and financial hurdles, I resolved to persevere. And then there was the matter of the telephone in Murray. Knowing Alexander Graham Bell had his own patent, I had the impetus to build something different, something groundbreaking. Simple, perhaps not the most elegant piece, but a wire-free telephone it was, a radio by any other name. Yet the gravity of this creation was not immediately apparent to me. I patented this vibrating telephone in 1888, when young Marconi was still figuring out his own path. For the next four years, I dedicated myself to crafting and installing these telephonists. In 1892, I turned to one of the few men I trusted, Dr. Rainey T. Wells, to witness another demonstration of my work. Little did he know, he'd become the first man to hear a true radio voice broadcast. Overwhelmed, Dr. Wells begged me to seek a patent, but I hesitated. Perfection was my goal, and I wasn't there yet. It took Dr. Wells and Con Lin, a skilled patent attorney, another 15 years to convince me that it was time to protect what I had pioneered. My first public demonstration in January 1902 was a turning point. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch covered it extensively, and the crowd witnessed the future, sound transmitted without wires. I had more requests for demonstrations than I could count, taking me to Washington, New York, and Philadelphia, but I hadn't even patented it yet. A mistake, perhaps, but I believed in the potential of my invention. Then Gerald M. Fennell came along, a promoter from New York. He convinced me to exchange all my research and equipment for 500,000 shares in the Wireless Telephone Company of America, a decision made out of necessity. I needed funds to continue my work. Gerald began hyping up my invention to investors, often embellishing its capabilities. And when he suggested we secretly install a cable to improve reception at the demonstration, I had had enough. I was an inventor, not a swindler. I publicly denounced Gerald and the company. But the treachery didn't end there. My 500,000 shares were suddenly reduced to 50,000 on paper. After I protested, they corrected it, but then allegedly stole the corrected certificate. My shares were never returned, and they turned out to be worthless. I went back to New York to dig deeper into the company's operations. It was clear that I had been swindled. On June 19, 1902, 
I wrote a letter to Mr. Turner, Secretary of the Wireless Telephone Company of America. Dear Sir, Mr. Gerald M. Fennell, the promoter of our company, has letters from me of which you have a copy. He has answered some, cleverly evading and practicing fraud or deception as usual, and there remains nothing for me to do but go home. I regret very much that such has been the ending, and regret very much that my name is connected in any way with this concern. I shall take immediate steps, when I reach home to turn on the lights, that the public may not be swindled by this fellow as I have been. It becomes my duty, as I am one of the directors, to see that this be a fair, legitimate business, or I am party to the fraud that may be committed. I very respectfully decline having a thing to do with the business until it is in every way, put on an honorable basis and put in the hands of men who will conduct it the same. The letter referred to is of June 17, 1902, and is in its nature a complaint against the aforesaid promoters, and should be seen by every member of the company. If you, sir, depend upon this man Fennel to put the matter before the company, they will never know the facts as I have presented them. I therefore ask that you provide each of them with a copy of same, that they may have a chance to adjust this matter, after which time, should they fail to act, then it remains to be clearly seen that they are parties to the swindle of me out of my inventions and the defrauding of the public. I shall notify each and all of them that you have such documents in your possession. To comply with my duty since I have signed over everything that I have to this concern, I do today, with Mr. Wally Hood, your fellow associate clerk as witness, turn over to you all the property in my possession belonging to the company, and depart from my Kentucky home with a feeling of gratitude for some New York people, who with me, have watched the steps of this man Fennel through many hours of uneasiness to me. Signed, Nathan B. Stubblefield. I secured a patent for my invention although it was years too late. In April 1907, I applied for the patent, and by May 1908, both the United States and Canada had acknowledged my innovation. However, by that time, the Collins Radio Company of Canada had already sold the rights to a similar invention to the Wireless Telephone Company of America for $7.5 million. The final chapter of my life stands in stark contrast to the promise and excitement of my earlier years. My wife left me. My children sold the family farm. I became a recluse, filled with suspicion and a sense of betrayal. Eventually, I took up residence in a small shack in Almo, Kentucky. When they found me dead in 1928, I was alone, except for my emaciated cat. It's believed that I died of starvation. Two years after my death, the New York Supreme Court confirmed the validity of my claims for patent rights, although they couldn't enforce them due to the statute of limitations. Let it be remembered that I was a pioneer. My innovations were among the earliest in the field. I did demonstrate a form of wireless communication before Marconi's renowned transatlantic Morse code transmission, even if our areas of focus differed. Perhaps the world wasn't ready for what I had to offer. Or maybe I wasn't prepared for the world's complexities. Either way, mine is a life of contrasts, filled with promise and loss, innovation and isolation. I hope that someday someone will recognize the full extent of what I achieved and learn valuable lessons from the trajectory of my life.